Thank God for that challenging word um, speaking to me, um, especially about the tipping, the wine workers coming to tip, tip over um, um, the uh, wine barrel or, or whatever, however you want to look at it. Um, and um, the Lord has been allowing things in my life to do that. Um, and, and with the word of God today showed me what it was, thank God for that, and in Jeremiah 48, um, that the things that, uh, things happening that allowed what I thought was his nature, thought was um, his power, was actually uh, my strength. Um, because when things happen, uh, used to have that power, used to have that self, what I'm finding out is self um, willpower. Um, now when I turn to it, it's not there anymore. Um, and what I was relying on, it makes me think of uh, Annie Crosby, uh, we was, uh, Annie Crosby about the, he giveth more grace that whenever, whenever the storehouse of our, uh, our, our strength um, that we've stored up over years of uh, good Christian living, as you would say, um, when we've went through all of that hoarded resources, that's when the Lord's uh, true power would come in our lives. And what the Lord has been showing me was that, um, especially this this week, um, He was taking me um, to be a partaker of His holiness. Um, and I was looking at partaking or sharing in or even um, partnering with the Lord. Uh, even in that word, it's the sharing in or partnering with um, his, uh, what he wants to do as we were hearing today, that it comes from him, him alone. Uh, Hebrews 6, uh, uh, 4 and 5, uh, I used to look at, uh, these two scriptures as uh, as look at it negatively um, I would look at it and look at it if I uh, it's impossible for those uh, who were once enlightened you know if I came to the Lord received of the Lord and then I turned back it's impossible for me to um, have repentance again or be granted repentance uh, and I used to focus in on that um, but uh, it's like the Lord honed in on the possibility that's in this scripture um, that for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. And I looked at this is what I can have from the Lord. Um, uh, I just make sure that if I, you know, of course, the scripture is giving me a warning, but I want this first that be once enlightened. I want a taste of the heavenly gift. I want to become a partaker of the Holy Spirit, and I want a taste of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. And what, what was coming to me was just tasting of the heavenly gift, tasting of the good word of God, uh, to have the partake of his holiness. And then, as we heard today, that it is impossible for me to sin. It's just not, it's the power of God is... Um, it's impossible. There's no way. It's not like a machine that had breaks down after a while and then you have to do preventative maintenance. So you have to shut it down and then have downtime and then bring it back up and then it begins to work as it should. But it, it's constant. Um, uh, Hebrews 9 talks about, uh, speaks about uh, the Lord Jesus. Um, if I can, uh, I believe it's, uh, 14 Hebrews 9 and 14 um, it's talking about the blood of Christ but then it starts saying something about Christ uh, make a statement about Christ it says how much more shall the blood of Christ Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God and he's able to cleanse you, your conscience from dead works and that's something that I've been uh, that, was that the Lord has sent those things um, and allowed those things to happen to the tipping 
to happen. Uh, there's a cry in my heart to partake, to taste of the heavenly gift, because it don't, can, can only come from him. Something that has so been in my heart for, for a while now, John 3, I believe it's around 27, talks about a man can receive nothing unless it comes from heaven. Like, I, it has to come from the Lord. That's the only place it can come from, his life. I can't receive it any other way. Um, and the Lord has is, is re uh, really been uh, teaching me uh, that. Um, and our well-known scripture in Second uh, Peter 3, uh, Second Peter 1, um, verse 3 and uh, 3 and 4. It says, as his divine power has given us all things um, and godly, uh, that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given, which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And, and as we heard, we don't want to deny that divine power. Um, we want to have the godliness, the true godliness that comes from the divine power of God and divine nature of God. Um, and and my, the last scripture that um, in 1 Corinthians 15, um, the Lord in his mercy, um, I see it as a mer an act of mercy and an act of love. Allowing these things, um, and as we heard today, just Lord, however, I don't want to have any of myself um, in in me. Uh, want to be uh, empty, uh, empty myself. First uh, Corinthians fifteen and forty nine, I see as a promise. Um, It said, and as we, and just as we, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, um, which is Christ Jesus. In my version, it said, we also, we also shall bear the image of the heavenly man, uh, which is Christ Jesus. Um, and if I continue to seek the Lord, just as I've borne, uh, inherited the image of the earthy, um, I believe there's a promise the Lord is showing that I can bear the image of the heavenly. I can have his nature, inherit his nature, partake of his nature. That is something the Lord has been speaking to me, and I thank God for the word today. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot is um, is about pre preserving my sense of neediness for the Lord and um, not not letting myself settle into a sense of contentment where I'm happy with, you know, I've achieved this level, this life, um, and you know, I fought for so long to come to this level, and now I've arrived, and um, a satisfaction sets in, and I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, just saying, Lord, I know um, that you meet our needs and uh, you especially come to those who are needy and I want to keep that sense of need no matter what level I've arrived at. Um, one of the verses I wanted to look at was in Philippians 4, verse 19. Where it says, um, And my God will supply all your needs, all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And the, the thing that um, has come to mind for me here is the contrast, the deep difference between um, your needs, there's a neediness there, and his riches. There's an abounding, bountiful wealth. And um, the picture that came to mind for me was actually, a, I imagined a, a needy, a beggar, you know, somebody just in deep poverty, and they meet a billionaire. And um, 
the cavern, the gap between the two is just this massive difference. And um, I, I kind of imagine that uh, the beggar looks at this man and, and he says, man, this guy can eat lunch every single day without thinking of it. And he just imagines how miraculous that life would be. Man, imagine if I could just eat lunch every day and I never had to think about it. And what he doesn't know is just, I mean, just how deep. He can't even imagine. I mean, the billionaire, a billionaire has a staff for his house. He's got a house manager who manages the staff. He's got a cook. He's got a, a daytime nanny and a nighttime nanny for every kid. And he can get on the phone with every major world leader. <laughs> you know, he can go anywhere in the world by the end of the day. And the, the, to the beggar, he sees this man, and he, maybe he's dressed nicely, and he just says, wow, imagine if I could have lunch every day. And I imagine, you know, it says in, um, in this verse, Philippians 4.19, it says that God will supply all our needs according to his riches. So, uh, again, you know, working with that picture, again, like uh, the billionaire is a very good man. He's not, it's not according to his spare change. He sees this beggar, and the, the amount that he's willing to give him is dramatic. It's massive. But if the beggar only says, you know, maybe I can get lunch every day from this guy. Every time he sees him pass by the same place and he gets lunch every day, or maybe uh, he says, man, this guy's so wealthy, maybe I can get an apartment. And the guy gets an apartment. And every day he's living, he's not, he's like, man, I'm not sleeping under the train bridge. I've got lunch every day. I'm good. I've arrived at the wealthy lifestyle. And um, just not knowing that this, this wealthy man, this billionaire is willing to get him an education, to get him a job, to get him, I, I bring him up to high society, you know, so he can have all the riches that he has. He wants to share um, his wealth with him because it's not according to his spare change. It's according to the riches that he has is how he wants to supply our needs. Um, and so some, sometimes it's hard for me when I'm not looking at how much more the Lord wants to give me. It's hard for me to preserve that sense of need a lot of it comes from just being happy with um with what i have in ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 it says ephesians 1 3 blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in christ and so the scripture teaches us that this is the blessing that God has given us. He's this multi-billionaire and he's actually, he's just already set aside the account and said, every single one of these blessings is yours, every single spiritual blessing. And so when I lose my sense of neediness, the thing I want to ask myself is, do I have every spiritual blessing? Do I have this perpetual joy of rejoicing always, a peace that surpasses understanding? Have I laid hold of the real life of Christ and a knowledge of God? Do I deeply know him? In a, in a moment, do I recognize the access that I have to the king of the universe, uh, have, I, have I put away every sin that even every Christian in the world would believe is small? Um, and I talked to, a, I was talking to a coworker a while back and um, he mingles in wealthy crowds and um, he had a friend who was very, very wealthy and he was talking to him about it. And, uh, and the friend was kind of laughing, just, you know, he, he might have hundreds of millions or something like that. And, um, he was laughing, saying, you know, it never really, I, I thought, you know, he had, he had this big success, and, um, and he thought, now I, uh, you know, I'm wealthy, I have everything, and then he, he started mingling with some billionaires, <laughs> and um, he saw this, like, this private island this one guy had, and he said, man, <laughs> I just don't, there's so much more that I don't have, and he, even once he had, uh, you know, and this is the world's uh, kingdom, right, it's, a, God turns this upside down where wealth is, meaningless but um but for the this wealthy man he just there was still a hunger was created when he saw oh man there's so much more i still don't i thought i was i thought i had all these riches um and he became unsettled and um and i want to preserve that kind of neediness for spiritual riches and, uh zero for the riches of the world in philippians again verse uh, chapter four verse eight um these are the things that we can think about it says Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, 100% pure, like pure gold, completely refined, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And so to me, this is like the kind of wealthy person who just keeps thinking about how much more he could have. And I think this is what the Lord is asking us to do is 
we might have so many spiritual riches he's given us, um, but will we set our mind on that perfect, on, on Christ, where he's the author, he's the target, he's the destination to be conformed to his image. And until we've arrived there, we have this sense of, of our poverty, that we're not wealthy, um, spiritually rich people like we might think we are. I think it's in Revelation, was the, I don't remember which church it was, but he said you, uh, you're blind and naked and wretched and poor. And they thought they were wealthy. They thought they were rich. And um, another thought along these lines is, is I think a good church can be like mingling with the wealthy. Um, it says in Hebrews 10, I want to mingle with people who are wealthier than me. That's a, a goal. And I want to be someone who has spiritual riches that um, I can motivate others who are around me to want that same wealth and that same knowledge of God. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says, um, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together. So when we assemble together, that purpose is that it's like you, you have this covetousness stirred up in your heart for something eternal, something greater, the, the, all the riches, every, every spiritual blessing that's been supplied to you, already put into a bank account in Christ. Um, and then one last verse here, um, just in Matthew 13, very short parable, Matthew 13, 44. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hid in the field, which a man found and hid again. So he, he saw it, he got a taste of it, he figured out where it was, and uh, from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. And I imagine the joy that this man had, he, there's a cost. There's definitely a cost to inheriting this wealth, this kingdom, and these spiritual riches. Um, and the cost, it says, was all he had. So it's our life, 100% our life. But the cost seems so small when you compare it to the uh, inheritance that we have. So my prayer is that I'm always seeking to um, keep that sense of need and I'm willing to pursue it, always be in pursuit of spiritual riches and, and also that I'm willing to pay the cost when the Lord asks for my life. Amen.